go with that one for just a little bit longer. I want to hear you this morning crying holy. Thank holy, you, Jesus. Holy. Thank you, Jesus. Sing it, Sister Mom. I dare you to lift your hands and just worship Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Like it's just you and Him. We exalt you, Father. Like it's just you and Him. You forget about being in church and you forget about who's beside you who may be watching and what's going Thank on you, later Jesus. after the service. And you forget about all that stuff called Thank life. You, you entertain the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He may not be visible in this service, but I want you to know He is real and He is here with you. He is here in this place. Yes, Lord, we worship you, God. Yes, thank you. Lift up your voice. Yes. Holy, 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 Jesus. holy is Lord God Almighty. We exalt you, Come on, Lord. 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 Come on, Lord.
we'll give them just a moment to get there so they can put the scripture on the screen for you. 1 Samuel 16, beginning in verse number 7. Beginning in verse number 7. And as you're turning, doesn't it feel good to be in the presence of the Lord? So doesn't it feel good to be in the presence of the Lord? Amen. Children's Church, you guys can go ahead and dismiss to the back. Oh, I feel His presence in this house. You don't get this just anywhere, do you? <laughs> they don't serve this up just anywhere. Only with God's people worshiping Him can you get in His presence. The Bible tells us, and we know this scripture is probably quoted as often as any in the Bible, but He inhabits the praises of His people. He inhabits the praises. I believe in the scripture yes. it says He inhabits the praises of Israel. Israel being his people in the Old Testament, but now in New Testament times, we are grafted in. We are the we are the nation of God. We are a peculiar people, as Peter says, and we are a holy nation. God has always been looking throughout the earth to find somebody to call his people that will lift him up and lift up the name of Jesus or his name above all names. And when we begin to lift his name up, his presence comes in, doesn't it? I feel him in this house this morning. I'm going to preach while they're going to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. That way I can preach twice. They're already there, ain't they? Man, I was hoping they'd have a little struggle finding it. I better read it, hadn't I? But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. We're going to go through verse number 13, so keep on going for us. Then Jesse called... Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel and he said neither hath the Lord chosen this then Jesse made Shammah to pass by and he said neither hath the Lord chosen this again Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel and Samuel said unto Jesse the Lord hath not chosen these and Samuel said unto Jesse are there are here all thy children and he said, There remaineth yet one, or yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit and sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in at, and he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And finally it says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of all, his, or of, all of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you. One more time, asking your blessing, your anointing, and your touch upon this service, Lord. God, I believe with all of my heart there are those here that you have preordained to be here to hear this word. And God, I pray that this word will go straight into the depth of their hearts. That it may begin to grow and bring forth a harvest. For we know your word is seed. And you just desire good ground to plant it in. So, Lord, I pray that everyone here this morning will receive this seed into good ground and that it will make a difference in their life and in the kingdom of God. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you would touch me and anoint me to preach your word. God, just as Isaiah had the coals from the altar to touch his lips, God, I pray that you will touch my lips with the coals of the altar. Yes. That I'll be able to speak your word with power and anointing that only you provide. And I'll be careful to give you praise and glory for it all. For it's not I, but it's you. Yes. You're working. You're doing. God, I ran from the call. God, I, I didn't even want to do it. But Lord, I surrender to your will rather than mine. Because thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Lord, it's about you. It's not about us. So we surrender everything to you and we praise you for what you are about to do in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start by saying this. When I come to church, I come to church expecting big things. So if you didn't come to church expecting big things, I hope you get impressed 
by what you weren't expecting before you leave. I want to preach this morning about the warrior within. I want to preach a little bit about the warrior within. And most of us in this house probably have heard a little bit, if not most of us have heard a whole lot about King David. David was a man, as the Bible says, that was after God's own heart. He was an individual that was highly used and highly favored in Israel in his day. And he was the second king of Israel and also most noted as the best king of Israel aside from Jesus Christ. And so what, what I want us to start out here, and I love the song choices this morning because we were going back to the heart of worship and, and as they were singing that song, and I didn't even really know what they were going to sing before we got here, but as we were singing that song, I thought it lined up perfectly with the message. As we are going back to the heart of worship, it's only God who sees what's on the inside. And the first thing I want us to look at this morning is the heart. God sees the heart of an individual. So in, in 1 Samuel, we're going to turn, you don't have to turn back, you can hopefully, they can uh, catch me on the screen, but in 1 Samuel chapter 13, I want us to look back here in 1 Samuel chapter 13, in verse number 14, where the Bible says that, that, that God has looked and sought for a man after his own heart, and this is what the Bible says about David, and it's also not just saying it about David, but the first portion is talking about Saul, the first king, and it says, but, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him, a man, after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And so God, in verse number 14 of chapter 13, has sent the same Samuel the prophet to talk to Saul, the first king and Saul was disobedient. If you don't know the story, Saul was disobedient. He did not accomplish all that the Lord had called him or commanded him to do in this situation. And so Samuel the prophet comes with the word of the Lord and he tells Dave or tells Saul that, that God has sought for a man that's after his own heart. And the first thing I want us to focus in is God sees what's in the heart of an individual. God and only God can see past the outward appearance and can see past all of the facade that you and I put on. Most of us, we, we have some sort of a, a, of a show that we put on for others. Not many people really know the real you. Can I get an amen? amen. Not many people really know the craziness that you might have, the... The, the spontaneous person you might be or, the, or maybe the, the person that out in front of everybody is putting on a show but on the inside you feel so alone and, and not everybody sees the, the, the real you and even the ones closest to us still can't completely understand what's going on inside of the heart of each and every individual. And I know that by scripture. We find that, that Jesse, the father of David, has all of his sons, aside from David, passed before the prophet Samuel to potentially be anointed king over all of Israel. And so we see that even David's own father missed it. He missed the warrior that was within David. He missed the one that really had a heart that was after God because we look for a big show. We look for charisma. We look for outside appearance. Maybe if they're tall, dark, and handsome, or maybe if they're lean and beautiful, then we'll let them into our little clique. But I've got news for you. God sees way deeper than that. And you and I should just go ahead and give him a hand clap of praise for the fact that we don't have to qualify for man, but we must qualify for God. And it's the heart that he looks at. And so we find in verse number 7 of chapter 16, it says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So God is obviously looking way deeper than what you and I can see about each other right now. Look over at your neighbor and say, God's seeing something I ain't seeing. That was all right. <laughs> Wasn't that good? Oh, what it is when you get to church. Everybody gets solemn and they feel like they can't say nothing and they have to be quiet. Well, if you're in a church, you can say something. All right, we're Pentecostals. We're at a Pentecostal church this morning, so you definitely need to be saying something. You've already figured that out, though. I don't have to tell you that. You probably, if you, when you figured that out, you either got two motives one to run or one to say. 
I might as well join in and shout and worship and give God praise because when you get in this atmosphere, you, you've got to do one or the other, don't you? Amen. I don't know how you can just sit back and not, but, but you just go ahead and participate. We'll be all right with it. I'll, I'll enjoy it thoroughly. Every amen I get, every praise Jesus, every look over at your neighbor and you participate with that, it's all right. It's okay. So look over at them one more time and say, God's saying something I ain't seeing. Somebody's, somebody's thinking, what could possibly be good in me? What possibly could I bring to the table? What possibly am I worth or my life worth that God could see something of value? I want you to know something. God knows every hurt, every pain, every mistake, every sin, every struggle, everything that's present. And past in your life. And even what's coming down the pipeline for the future. And God still sees potential in you and I. Amen. God still sees an opportunity to use His Spirit in our lives to touch others. He still sees a warrior within. Amen. Some of us have to understand that it's time to wake up the warrior within. Quit sitting on the sidelines and quit passively watching life go by and not meaning, not having a life that's full of meaning, but getting on the battlefield, making our minds up and doing something for the kingdom, work and will of God in our lives. Nobody wants to get to the end of the road and say, I didn't accomplish anything for God. I truly believe that. If there is somebody like that, they're just full of the devil. But most people, somewhere deep down inside, they, they really want to leave an impact that's good. They really want to get in a relationship with God and walk hand in hand with Him. But they allow things in this life, sinful desires, outside influences to pull them away from the presence of God. Amen. I believe it's time that you let God search deep down in you, find what's good, find what's bad, get rid of the bad, and pull out the good and make you a warrior, put you on the battlefield for Christ. We used to sing these songs like this. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I'm on the battlefield for, and I'm going to fight till I die. Amen. We find sometimes that it's hard, it's hard just to get people to come to church, much less to get on the battlefield and fight till they die. Amen. But I've got news for you. I believe that we're, we've been praying, and I believe that we are going to experience a move of God where people that are truly hungry and have a heart for something more than just the regular day-by-day -day Christianity that really want to just go all out, jump in, jump, jump over the edge and lose themselves in God and be a warrior or a person that's on the battlefield for the Lord and God sees what's in your heart. And if you'll allow Him to do some heart surgery on, this, on you this morning, He's going to pull out the bad, amen, and exalt the good and He's going to place you in the kingdom for such a time as this. So Samuel... Instantly, the Lord spoke to Samuel when he saw David. He said, anoint him. Anoint him. This is him. This is the man. Anoint him because God's seen his heart. Even though David was, he was easy to look at. He, he, was, he, wasn't, the, he wasn't as ugly as me probably. But, but <laughs> it was something deeper that God saw. That's right. Something a little deeper that God began to realize he could use this man. And I've got news for you. I know most of you in here. Some of you I know real good. Some of you I just met today. But for most of you, I know you. And I know that some of you struggle. I know some of you struggle pretty bad. I know some of you have been in some dark places in this life. Guess what? God knows that too. And just alongside of God, I want to take on the heart of God and I want to encourage you to not live where you were, but learn to be everything that God wants you to be. I will never be a pastor that limits you as best of my ability. God never let me limit an individual by where they've been or by what my expectations are of them. I believe somehow, some way that God can get in the mix of all of your humanity and do some, something supernatural in your life and through your life, regardless of where you've been. The devil is a con man, 
And he'll con you out of your future. He'll tell you that your past is too great for you to have a future in God. He'll try to convince you that, that all of the struggles that you've been through in life and all of the sin that you've wallowed in automatically disqualify you. But I've got news for the devil this morning. The blood of Jesus is against you, Satan. And all of my sin has been washed spotless white through the cross of Calvary. And through Jesus, I can be a mighty warrior on the battlefield for my Lord. It doesn't take anything more or anything less than the blood of Jesus to rise you up, raise you up into the kingdom for such a time as this, to place you on the battlefield. Get out of that place you keep wallowing around in. My goodness gracious, I'm talking like a pastor. I don't know if people are just lazy. They ain't lazy, are they, Missy? Okay, maybe they are. I don't know who that was, but I like them. Maybe it is something's just lazy. If you're lazy, I hope you get ashamed at all that everybody else is starting to do for the kingdom of God. But if you're not lazy, maybe it's just you feel like you're inadequate or you're, you, you don't have the qualifications that it takes to... To really do something for God. I encourage you to read the Bible. <laughs> I've read this book. And I found that God oftentimes uses the people that are the most messed up. The least qualified. That have the lowest amount of ability. And he uses them the most. Amen. He takes those that stutter like Moses. And puts them before kings to speak for him. Isn't that amazing that God Almighty put someone such as Moses to speak to a king on God's stead? I still can't figure it out why he called me to preach. I've listened to a lot of preachers that I feel like are way better than me, way more qualified, and have, have the ability to get results a whole lot more than I do. And I sometimes wonder, God, why did you call me? But I've read the book, and the book tells me that he doesn't call everybody that's got it all together, that most of the time he calls people that don't have it all together, so he can put it back together and use them for the glory of God. And so it doesn't matter what your past is, doesn't matter what your present is, what matters is what's on the inside, and only God can see your heart, and what everybody else has pushed to the side as someone that's never going to achieve, that's never going to make it in life, that God and nobody else cares about, God will pick you up out of all of that stuff and use you for His kingdom's glory. And I, for one, am happy about that. I'm happy about that. Because there are those in life that have disqualified myself. There are those that told me I'd never make it. There are those who told me that, there, that I wasn't any good for anything. Amen. But there were a few people along life's road that spoke life into me. Just like I'm speaking life into you. And I had a choice to choose that. Jesus, the Word of God tells us that, that God presents to His people life or death. And He says to choose life. Amen. And it's our choice to choose that life. If there's a warrior within you, you've got to choose to activate him. You've got to stir up the gift of God that's within you. You've got to, as Paul told Timothy, lay hold on eternal life. You've got to fight the good fight of faith. You've got to run your own race. You've got to make your mind up that regardless if anybody else is going to be beside you, you've got Jesus. And Jesus and you are enough to win the race. Amen. So get your mind made up and let your heart fall in line and get to work for the kingdom of God. Be what God's called you to be. Whew. Satan's plot's nothing compared to God's plan for your life. And when he, when he sought to kill, steal, and destroy you, when he's after you, when the hounds of hell are nipping at your heels, it's a good indication that God's hand is on your life and there's purpose in you. And you'll find out the hounds of hell is just toothless chihuahuas. They're nothing compared to the power of our God. Amen. <laughs> yeah, I know he puts up a good fight. Yeah, I know some of y'all are thinking, you shouldn't have said that about the devil because he's been riding me. Well, I found out he's going to ride you whether you fight or don't fight, so you might as well just put up a struggle and let him know that you entered the ring. <laughs> Amen. Lord, I better move to point number two. 
the importance of the anointing. So we see that God sees the heart. He saw the heart of David. He saw all of his brothers. But he also saw the heart of one that kind of was left out of the, the mix. Kind of left out of the picture. And others really didn't see the significance that they might play in the kingdom. And so God sees his heart. But there's also something very important. In verse number 13 of our original text, it says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Here we see the prophet Samuel acting in the, in the stead of God while he's anointing David. He is he's doing a visual demonstration of you will if you will of what God y'all gotta pray for that stuttering spirit to get off me I feel like Moses <laughs> so he's acting in the place of, of God and he's pouring the anointing oil visually you can see the oil going on to David and so Samuel is demonstrating what God was doing in the life of David and Samuel was demonstrating what God wants to do in your life and in my life. The anointing of God. In the Old Testament, prophets, priests, and kings would be anointed for the task at hand. And I've got news for you. Also in Joel chapter 2 and in Acts chapter 2, we find that the Bible says that in the last days I will what? Pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And so God is demonstrating the, in, in, in Joel and in Acts and, and what Samuel done here is a portrait of what God wants to do in our life. Everybody is a candidate as long as they get their heart right. And so when you get your heart right with God, when God really sees into the heart and you open up to Him, that's intimidating, isn't it? Because as you open up to God, let me tell you something. You're not going to carry the anointing with a dirty heart. I want that to sink in for just a moment. We're not going to carry the anointing with a dirty heart. Now that, to me, is very troubling because I know my own heart. And sometimes it feels pretty black and cold and lifeless. So we have to understand that in order for us to carry the anointing, we must open up to God. God understands that we're not perfect, that we're not sinless. He understands that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so understanding that, it's up to you and I to do one of the most intimidating and, and difficult things that any human being will ever do. And that's open up ourselves, expose ourselves totally to God and say, you know everything about me. You see everything that's going on in this heart of mine. And so Jesus, I need you to help me with what I can't help myself with. Jesus, I need you to get on the inside because the work of Calvary starts on the inside of a human being. It doesn't start with you cleaning up the outside and straightening your life out, then come to God. It starts with the cross of Calvary getting deep down in the sacrifice of Jesus, penetrating into your heart and removing the sin that you've committed and living a life close to God. Am I saying you'll be perfect and you'll never sin? No, I'm not saying that. John said if any man says he doesn't sin, that he's a liar. And so we understand that we struggle with sin all of our days. Amen. But to know God is to hate sin. Bless me, Jesus. That's good preaching. Because there's a lot of people that want to condemn, condone sin because they really don't love God. And as they condone sin, they say, well, there's no need in worrying about living right because God understands you're not going to be perfect, so there's no need in trying. You might as well just do what you're going to do. There's grace. God will forgive you. Yes, there's grace, and yes, God forgives. Amen. But when you really fall in love with God, you really start to hate sin. Yes. 